think of a roller coaster, what type do you think of? There are a lot of roller coaster types. Some you sit, some you fly, some you hang onto the track, some you are launched at unthinkable speeds, but there is one type that stands out above the rest, and that is the stand up coaster. And today, I'll be talking about the history of the stand up coaster. In 1935, Mr. Teiji Yamada founded the Toyo Garu Key Company and built his first attraction, a five-foot-tall mechanical walking elephant that was a popular attraction at one of Tokyo's neighborhood parks. Yamada reorganized his company in 1949 and changed the name to Togo. Togo built its first roller coaster in 1953 at Hanayashiki Park in Tokyo. That coaster is still in operation and is the oldest roller coaster in Japan. Simply called the roller coaster, the ride is 767.8 feet long and reaches a max height of 36.1 feet. A good start for the company, yet what they had in store was much bigger and it would help them stand out from the competition. In 1979, Togo built Mo Manga Standing and Loop Coaster. In 1982, Togo manufactured their first stand-up coaster trains. The first coaster was to be getting them was not Mo Manga. Actually, beating it up by just one day was Dangai at Thrill Valley Amusement Park in Japan. Another former sit-down looping coaster that Togo had built that was also converted from its original sit-down trains to its new stand-up ones. However, a day later, Momanga opened with its new stand-up trains, and both these rides have since closed, with Dangai closing in 2002 and Momanga closing in 2021. However, these coasters caught the attention of aerodynamics. In 1976, Worlds of Fun in Kansas City, Missouri opened Scream Roller, an aerodynamics corkscrew coaster. After aerodynamics saw what Togo had created, they began to create their own stand-up coaster trains. In 1983, the trains were added and Scream Roller was no more and had now become Extreme Roller, Ooh. the first stand-up coaster in the United States of America. While not the first ground-up stand-up coaster in America, it was still the first stand-up coaster in the USA. However, the structure and track of Extreme Roller were not designed for the stand-up trains, which were putting too much stress on the track and supports. In 1984, the sit-down trains were back, and it stayed that way until the ride's removal in 1988. However, this would not deter Arrow, who in 1984 took the River King Mine Train at Six Flags St. Louis and added the stand-up trains again, renamed to Rail Blazer, Blazer, not that Rail Blazer at California's Great America. Like Extreme Roller, the track wasn't intended for use with the stand-up trains and a fatal accident in 1984 involving a passenger that fell to her death prompted a recall of the trains. The original trains and name were then restored back to their former glory, and the ride still operates today. However, this wasn't the only stand-up coaster standing up to the challenge in 1984. On April 22, 1984, Kings Island in Mason, Ohio debuted the King Cobra, a Togo stand-up coaster, and the first stand-up coaster that was not a retrofit. The ride began when you stepped into their strains, adjusting your bicycle seat, because yeah, that keeps your legs in place, and head cushion. Then you would secure your lap bar, and then you're off. However, I want to explain in more depth how a stand-up coaster restraint works. On a standard roller coaster, the rider is held in their seat by some form of harness, such as a lap bar or an over-the-shoulder restraint. As stand-up coasters, by design, don't have any seats. The harness system must both restrain and support the rider. Typical stand-up roller coaster harnesses are mounted on vertical posts, which allow the harness to adjust to riders of different heights. At the bottom is a seat resembling that on a bicycle, while at the top is an over-the-shoulder harness. Togo models normally use a lap bar to further secure the riders. 
Now that I've gotten that out of the way, let's talk about the ride experience. After guests had secured their restraints, they descend the 95 foot tall lift hill and then turn 180 degrees to the right and begin to descend the first drop. The riders were then welcomed by the first and only vertical loop which was taken quickly and smoothly. Shortly after, the train climbed up the first Camelback Hill, allowing for some floater air time, and then dropped into a 540 degree helix which had riders standing almost completely sideways. Upon exiting the helix, the second Camelback Hill was encountered and followed by the unique trick track section of the ride, where the track was straight but banked to the left before turning to the right, before hitting the bra brake run. The track went over two bunny hills, allowing brief moments of airtime before the ride came to a complete stop. The train then turned to the right and was brought back into the station. The ride was given generally favorable reviews, and the King's Entertainment Company, who owned King's Island, King's Dominion, and Canada's Wonderland, and a few more parks at this time before being bought by Paramount and then finally being bought by Cedar Fair, decided to clone King Cobra in 1985. And then Sky Rider opened in May of 1985 at Canada's Wonderland. The ride, besides the paint job and the name, were the exact same. Again, the ride was given generally favorable reviews, and the choice was made to build another stand-up coaster, this time at my favorite park, King's Dominion in Doswell, Virginia. Shockwave opened in 1986, this time being another clone. Almost, at least. Because a second Camelback was added before the final break run, making this coaster unique. Ooh. However, this won't be the only ride of its kind, sending shockwaves in 1986. Introducing Shockwave. If you think you can take it, stand up. In 1986, Intamin, another coaster manufacturer, opened Shockwave at Six Legs Magic Mountain. Reaching a height of 90 feet, it had one inversion. The ride was part of the Six Legs Ride Rotation Program that dismantled and moved around rides to all Six Legs parks during the late 80s and early 90s. Two years later, the ride closed and was dismantled. Two years after that, it reopened as at Six Legs Great Adventure under the same name. Two years after that, it was closed again, dismantled, and sent to Six Flags Astro World, this time sticking around until the closure of the park in 2005. Opening in 1993, Batman The Escape. And then just a year later, another shockwave opened, this time at Drayton Manor in the United Kingdom. Originally having a 7-Up sponsorship and being called the 7-Up Shockwave, just like the Pepsi Max Big One at Blackpool Pre Pleasure Beach in the United Kingdom, also in the United Kingdom. <laughs> If you think you can take it, stand up. Shockwave. Only at Drayton Manor. Shockwave at Drayton Manor didn't also just take the name from Shockwave at Six Flags Magic Mountain. They also completely ripped off the commercial. Woo! It's different, however, from the original Shockwave at Magic Mountain because this one has four inversions, which are a loop, two corkscrews, and an element exclusive to only one stand-up coaster in the world while featured on many other coaster models, a zero-g roll, and it's the only stand-up coaster remaining in Europe to this day. The track on the Intamin rides were designed by two standout designers named Walter Bolagard and Claude Mavillard. In 
1987, Walter Bolgard and Claude Maviard left Giovanola and created their own company called B&M. When B&M was created, the pair had agreed to not make any more amusement attractions. However, Robert Mampe, Six Flags Great America's staff engineer who had worked with both men during the construction of Z-Force, contacted the new company and asked it to reconfigure the cars for its Giovanola built Intamin bobsled coaster that was to be relocated from Six Flags Great America. Following that project, Mampe asked the new company to design and build a stand-up roller coaster for Six Flags Great America. From quite a distance away, you can hear the screams from the brave riders who are at Six Flags Great America to be among the first to experience the Iron Wolf. What sets this space age roller coaster apart from others is the design. You're riding in a standing position. This is the third one in the United States. Uh, and we just think it's going to be a great, great success, primarily because of the uniqueness of the stand-up feature. Once aboard the coaster, riders stand, but are secured in place by an over-the-shoulder and chest restraint. There is also a bicycle-type adjustable seat for added support. It looks like we're ready to go. Here we go. Here we go. In typical roller coaster fashion, the Iron Wolf slowly climbs up a 100-foot hill only to abruptly rocket down a 90-foot drop at speeds reaching 55 miles an hour before it enters a 360-degree vertical loop towering 80 feet in the air. It was at this point that I said, I don't know where the sounds came from, they just came out. The ride ends with a series of hairpin curves and a corkscrew-type loop that brings the passengers back nearly parallel to the ground before entering the terminal. Now that I've survived the Iron Wolf, I'll admit that I'm no professional, but I am converted to the belief that riding roller coasters can be fun. You don't have to be cool. You can even make loud noises. And that coaster was Iron Wolf which opened in 1990 at Six Lakes Great America. The ride featured two inversions and eventually it closed in 2011 and was dismantled and sent to Six Flags America, opening under the new name Apocalypse and eventually closing again in 2019, this time being converted to a floorless coaster named Firebird that still operates today. Other stand-up coasters B&M have made include Vortex of Carowinds, opened in 1992, Mantis, now converted to a floorless coaster named Rougarou, opened in 1996 at Cedar Point, although, what the hell is a Rougarou? Vortex at California's Grey America, opened in 1991, converted to a floorless coaster named Patriot, Chang at Six Lakes Kentucky Kingdom, now known as just Kentucky Kingdom, opened in 1997, closed in 2009, dismantled and reopened at, as Green Lantern at Six Lakes Great Adventure, where it still operates today. And The Riddler's Revenge at Six Flags Magic Mountain, opened in 1998, also features the most inversions on a stand-up coaster, six to be exact, and is the tallest and fastest stand-up coaster standing 156 feet tall and reaching a top speed of 65 miles an hour. And finally, the last new stand-up coaster to this day, the Georgia Scorcher at Six Flags Over Georgia. This is a relatively small stand-up coaster, however, only having two inversions and a height of 107 feet. <laughs> Over the past few years, stand-up coasters have become increasingly rare, with King Cobra at King's Island closing on November 5th, 2001. Skyrider at Canada's Wonderland hung on until September 1st, 2014. It's actually still in operation today, known as Freestyle at Cavallino Mato in Italy. Shockwave at King's Dominion followed within a year, and, and on August 9th, 2015, it closed and was scrapped, leaving all Togo coasters in North America defunct. Besides the Manhattan Express at the New York, New York Casino in Las Vegas, but why would you want to ride that? Really, why? 
Shockwave at Drayton Manor still operates to this day, but it's unknown for how much longer it will last. Batman The Escape was scra scrapped eventually. As for the B&M stand-ups, they mostly have a happy ending, with none defunct, but most converted. Yet, who knows how much longer these rides can stand the test of time before they have to take a seat. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please like, and if you really enjoyed it, please also subscribe. It's completely free, and you could always change your mind later. Thank you for watching. Please also share with a friend if they do so care. See you next time. Bye-bye.